Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this session. I'd like to say that after all the tawdry sessions you've had about the contents of people's fridges, how big their houses are and so forth, <laughs> we are now in for a very big treat. Um, the chance to hear from a woman who has made so many movies happen, and it's fair to say without whom there would be no British film industry of anything like the depth the magnitude and the brilliance that we have today. Um, she has been a centrifugal force in British film, nothing less. And so um, it's wonderful. She is the nurturer of talent, the go-to person for welcoming ideas, Tessa Ross. 13 years ago, she took over the disaster that was film four. <laughs> And she gave us the delights, many of which you're going to see this morning, of films such as This Is England, Slumdog Millionaire, and then just after, two weeks after, 12 Years a Slave, won two Academy Awards. She could just have rested on that big set of laurels at Channel 4 for the rest of her career, but she's got far too much to do. So she decided just two weeks after Slumdog, um, um, 12 Years a Slave did so brilliantly that she would move on to her next challenge. She announced that she was leaving. However, this morning is a chance to talk to her about some of her greatest hits um, the, and also preview material that's not been seen yet. Some of it's not finished, it's not even graded, it's still in the cutting room, but she's wrenched it out of the cutting room to give you uh, a chance to see it this morning. So the idea is, the way we're going to run this session is, is great because you, know, you can't pitch to Tessa. You know, there's no point in pitching to her. You can ask her questions. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask her about film, which is great. What a liberation that is. And um, I'm going to talk to her for a few minutes. We're going to see some of the greatest hits and uh, talk some more and then uh, open questions to the audience before we see some more clips. Um, as I said, you have really been um, a centrifugal force in British film and a kind of gathering in of talented people. Um, and I wondered, it's not as if you've got a mission statement, but what is it that you set out to do? And perhaps the best way of putting it is, what was your pitch for Film 4 when it was just such a disaster? Um, well, the disaster that you're describing had a very particular remit. So the disaster was over 60 people in a separate building being made redundant when a new chief executive came in. Um, after a big ambition of commercial films, working with Hollywood, um, an integrated studio, distribution, sales, all working together with 35 million quid a year so that big films could get made and we could work on a world stage. So the disaster was, was about how much money one needed to sustain that sort of business. So when all those people were terribly, sadly, made redundant, um, it was six months before I was given the job because I've been head of drama beforehand at Channel 4 of rebuilding mm -hmm. or representing what mm -hmm. was possible. Mm -hmm. And I think probably at that moment my job was how little money could Channel 4 spend with how few people, I, how little was the risk that we could make the best possible mm -hmm. work with. And so my pitch was making money is hard. You want to spend as little money as possible. Nobody knows what works. If we did, wouldn't we all have the houses you've been showing off today? Or maybe the fridges. I don't know whether the fridge was big. Um, lots of cupcakes in it. Lovely. Um, but we don't. We yeah. don't. And the remit of Channel 4 is so special and so particular. And it, it is a distributor. It's showing mm -hmm. work to an audience. It knows that audience. It knows talent. What's the worst thing that can happen with a film? That we know the talent, that we want to support that talent, and that we have an appetite to reach an audience mm -hmm. with the stories that that talent wants to tell. The best that happens is that distributors take it on, audiences take it on, the world takes it on, and we might have a hit. So let's prioritise differently. And I went to Mark Thompson and to his board and said, with 10 million, with 11 people, um, with this ambition, let me try and make it work. So it was pretty clear, actually, but with the huge benefit, I would say, of starting a company in, in a hidden space, mm -hmm. in a much more organic way, in a way that was not, well, you know, the word defunct was attached to Film 4 for many years, Mm -hmm. and, and continued to be until, say, Last King of Scotland, which we'll see a little bit of later, came on. So came, came and, and broke us out again. Um, and so I was able to do it in a way that honestly was organic and to start to bring talent back in and convince them that what we stood for at Channel 4, which was the risk-taking, the talent, the voices of, of question rather than of repetition, um, the looking for the new, was what Film 4 stood for. And, and David Rose, who had set up Film 4, mm -hmm. had always been a personal hero, and mm -hmm. I was able to sort of have 
him in my head yeah. as a bit of a mentor. And we're going to see in a little, in a little while how looking for the new developed over the, the, those 13 years. But going much further back, um, when you were um, starting out, you know, what do you think was your guiding principle? And who was that person, if there was one person that gave you that in drama? In drama? Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, there are a number of people, actually. I couldn't pick one, but I was a mad theatre goer. So I did love directors. And in mm -hmm. fact, Bill Bryden, who I went to work for at yeah. BBC Scotland, was a hugely influential both stage director and maverick boss mm -hmm. when I went to work for him. Um, David Rose, whom mm -hmm. I worked with as a young woman when I was at British Screen, who I thought was the wisdom of the best sort of wisdom, kind wisdom, mm -hmm. um, but clear. Um, I, you know, and then, of course, the filmmakers, the writers, the people who come along and tell yeah. you stories and present something of themselves in a way that allows you to think, oh, well, I'm going to be that brave, or I'm going to have a go at something like or I'm going to think yeah, that Yeah, and way. I wonder also, from that point of view, then, how you, do, you carried on looking at the kind of talent that you were going to nurture when you started at Film 4. Mm. You say you had 11 people, and at the end of this session, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that you're leaving behind us massive slate, yeah. an absolutely massive slate. But when you actually looked at the process, what is it about the process that you like the most about, you know, from spotting that director, spotting that script, spotting the new, what yeah. is it? Well, that sounds so much better than the way it is, um, in the sense that it, you know, there's so much to take pleasure from. Um, it's, it, the spotting is a process, in a way, there's the process of watching, of reading, and mostly of meeting, I think of hearing what it is people want to do, of believing people, of, of finding that you've never met a writer, that you've read their work and you realise they have something extraordinary to say, um, of a team working together that actually bind, are bound together by something that's bigger than themselves, which is brilliant, um, of watching people work on set. You know, you walk onto a set having started an idea three or 13 years before, and actually, you know, 150 people, people could be working from an idea being realised. Success of careers, reinvention of careers, um, but also sustaining a, of careers, I yes. suppose. You know, I think the sustaining, the sustaining of careers, because those careers then sustain, bring on other people. I think, I think it's, it's the idea that, that what I believed Film Four should do um, was was not buy into success mm -hmm. for its own sake, was buy into a journey of an mm -hmm. artist, of a storyteller. Um, and actually what that enables us to do is allow people to worry about the next project, not just the one that's there. And I think that engagement, particularly if you're the right place for that talent, if you're the right place for that storyteller, then actually you know jolly well that all their work won't work. It's very rare to have a Steve and McQueen, to, you know, to yes. three films that work. But, but mostly people have a film that works and two that don't, that don't. And actually you have to believe in people's possibilities alongside them in order to make great work happen. Well, let's see some of that great work you did make happen. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there must be, for all of us in there, films that are just standout, films that we'll always remember, but it's also about the relationships that you have put together that have made those films so brilliant. There's so much to talk to you about. But first of all, looking at those films, what does success look like? Does it always look like that, or can it look different? Oh, of course it can look different. Mm. I mean, it can look like money to some people, mm. and it can look like um, less work. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it was about how big a space we could build or how warm a space we could build for as many talented people as possible, for the team to express their own tastes by inviting that talent in. And actually, the more you see, the more you grow, the more you let breadth of taste develop and happen, actually, the truth is, then maybe success does look like that. I mean, they're, they're all so different. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a you know, huge number of people who've put a huge amount of their lives into those pieces mm -hmm. there. But, uh, but when you saw the roster of films, an extraordinary amount of films, not all have been commercial successes. No. Does that matter? Does that matter when you're working for, well, when you're delivering for your paymasters as well? Um, well, it matters in all sorts of, you know, in a way success has a number of different ways mm -hmm. of delivering. Um, I think it would be pretty terrible to be in a commercial industry, and it is an industry, and only make films that never made anybody any money. Mm -hmm. and not least because what we're doing is we're sharing revenues very early on with our producers, mm -hmm. and of course the sustainability of a sector, which is a very difficult sector to work in. I mean, television, which this festival is about, has a thriving you know, industry because there's a hungry pipe in lots of places that's chewing up television that wants that product. Mm -hmm. 
film finds it very difficult to find those homes in distribution. And so finding the support structure for producers and for talent to sustain a livelihood where they can make the next film is very important and has been part of our remit at Film But I mean, you've got 10 million a year. Well, we've now got 15. So well, we, have, and it, we look at those films, it is nothing. It is nothing, but it's also hugely valuable if you spend it the right way. And the way that we've managed to achieve it, I think, has been by being very tactical, um, very clear what we are able to do, very clear that we're not about money. I mean, nobody's coming to us because they think we can write them a big cheque. They're coming to us because we're more than our money. And what we stand for is, of course, the possibility um, of the range and breadth of ambition of, of adventure that those films represent. But also, we, re we also stand for the relationship we can then deliver to those mm. filmmakers in, in realising their films. And those filmmakers include producers in the early stages in development, writers in the early stages of ideas and research, and filmmakers who are on mm. their first short or their fifth feature film. So the, again, the experience is massive. Um, so tactically, spending money, a lot of our 15 million in development, building those ideas, so that we're in the as early stages wherever possible, imagining the end result with the people who are going to make mm. those films, allows us a seat at the table when we sit with the big money, with the big studios. Well, let's, um, let, let's talk about the big money. Let, well, first of all, let's talk about Steve McQueen and Steve McQueen and Fassbender's relationship right through hunger, shame, uh, 12 years a slave. Um, how did you nurture that relationship when uh, Steve McQueen first came with hunger? Well, hunger was, was a brilliant example of why Channel 4 works so well. Hunger came via relationship through the um, head of arts at the time, a wonderful woman called Jan Young Husband. Mm -hmm. And Jan knew Steve um, and said to Steve, you should make a film. Well, she was right. Because of course um, he was a visual artist. He was a visual artist, he'd won the Turner Prize. And um, she invited him in and, he, and Steve and she and Peter Carlton, mm -hmm. who was my commissioning editor at the time, sat and spent four years developing Hunger. They introduced him to Enda Walsh, who worked with him on the screenplay. And, and Channel 4 paid for most of that film. Um, you know, Film 4 was supporting it, but it was a Channel 4 commission. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an extraordinary piece of work. I don't know how many people in the room have seen it, but it was an extraordinary mm -hmm. piece of work. And it was an unpretentious, humane, brilliant mm -hmm. film that went to Cannes, mm -hmm. that won the Camera Door, which is a, an amazingly prestigious prize. That year was extraordinary. I mean, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it, it still is a, a film I think that everybody ought, ought to see almost. Yes. Um, but it was impossible not to know that the man was the real deal. Yeah. He is the real deal. It wasn't, didn't take anybody. I mean, it, it didn't take me to know. Um, and so the job of spending time working with him and developing shame was clearly the next mm -hmm. job. And he had a huge appetite for making film. Yeah. Um, but this is a man who has a huge appetite for work. This is a man who, you know, if, if the idea is an art piece, it will be an art piece and he'll do it quickly mm -hmm. and he'll do it urgently. And if it's a film, he'll throw it around, he'll wrestle with it. And we work very closely and with Abby Morgan on shame. Yes. Yeah, so, so let's then look at 12 Years a Slave. I mean, how do you keep... You, you know, now, of course, Steve McQueen, the massive success of 12 Years a Slave, when that was being made, even by the time that was being made, the budgets were bigger. Obviously, it was a much, much bigger budget for 12 yes. Years a Slave. How do you keep your place at the table? I mean, well, that was really interesting because that was not in any way traditional for us. That was a film that was developed away from us. Plan B and Steve had developed it together. But Steve wanted us with him, wanted me with him. Wanted you with him, that's quite me, but clear. Us, I, well, yes, but in truth, because of the ideal that we stand for, it might have been somebody else as well, but my relationship had been built with that filmmaker. And um, in, the, in the first instance, we were probably reasonably separate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Steve would talk to me about the script and tell me what was going on, and I went to visit the set, saw where his frustrations and pleasures were in the, in the making of the film. And but there was those a frustrations, point. could you help with those frustrations? Yes, absolutely. And, what, and that's give, when give, me I became, an, give me an example of one. Um, well, the frustration came very, very, very visibly um, when Steve was in the early stages of the edit. Um, and I went to see him in the edit, and we talked about the problems of the film and the brilliant bits of the film. And it started to become clear to Steve what pickups, what new bits of, of material he needed in the film. And this is a film about a shameful, shameful period of American mm -hmm. history, financed by commercial American money. Mm -hmm and their expectations that the film would be a success were small. So the request for more cash to be spent on that film were not welcome. Mm -hmm. And what Film 4 was able to do was to commit the money for those extra mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. of filming, for the extra set design mm -hmm. to Steve, because it was about Steve, and it was about Steve's work being completely mm -hmm. fulfilled. So we came in with the cash. So we were a minority And you, ju and you could justify that 
come in with that cash? Well, my justification was partly commercial. You only have a hit if you have a great yeah. film, and you only have a happy filmmaker who wants to make the yeah. next film if you've wrestled yeah. and struggled to deliver. And how does that kind of relate to the public service remit of Channel 4, when you're making a film at 12 years of slave? Well, I think that the public service remit, again, is so it, it can be answered broadly. But in that instance, is that we, Britain, have developed the most amazing filmmaker from the most amazing yeah. artist, and we can take pride in the fact that we've used a public company, to, a, public, a publicly yeah. owned yes. company, to do that. And we've done it because we believed 100% in his vision for that film. And it's interesting that because you have this incredible relationship with Steve McQueen, um, I wonder if you'll make his next film with Channel 4. Well, I think he will, is the answer to that. Um, you know, the, the relationship that we've built with Steve is no longer just with me. I have a yeah. fantastic team at Channel 4. And... Um, Steve's next project is in development. Steve's committed to that relationship beyond me, which mm -hmm. makes me very happy. And, well, that means two Academy Awards. I mean, it's been such a fetid film. What? Three. Uh, three, sorry, sorry, three. <laughs> three. <laughs> you have been hiding one under your bed. Uh, what happens when it's not a success in, well, it's not a success in the traditional sense of commercial. It's not a success in the critical sense. Mm -hmm but it's something that you still feel passionate about. I mean, I was looking there at that roster, and if I take one film, just, just, it just came to me the, at the moment. I watched, I went, I mean, I'm passionate about Wuthering Heights, and I watched Wuthering Heights, and I can't imagine that Wuthering Heights was financially a success. No, it wasn't. Um, but Andrew Arnold is an exceptional filmmaker, another one. Um, and Andrew Arnold's next film is on the edge of going into production. Um, and what I think is interesting about Wuthering Heights is that it, it tells you the story that filmmaking is a journey, that any work is a journey. Mm and that the making of Wuthering has actually informed hugely the process she's going through in making the next film. I would say that two-thirds of Wuthering Heights are an extraordinary film, mm -hmm. and the complications of growing up those children. Mm -hmm. I mean, she understood something about the abused lives those children led so beautifully, and she understood that novel in a way that I'd never mm -hmm. understood mm -hmm. it before. Um, but she felt pressures of different sort in delivering yeah. that final version of the film. And it has definitely informed how she's making the next uh, one. But, but the thing is that that you took... So out of the, the you know, two-thirds success, one-third failure, where other people making judgments yes. might decide, you know, that's it, Andrea Arnold can go somewhere else. You have stuck with her. And, yes. and then that will be rewarded in the next film, you, you know, you hope it will be. You can be blind, I think. I think you can very easily say, well, we'll just do everything you do, and that's a nonsense. Mm. But I think you can also say, because you can't, I couldn't, make, I couldn't invest in every one of Ken Loach's films, for no. example. He makes so many. But equally, you can say, um, at each stage, I've built a safe enough relationship to question and challenge this person. Mm. And what is the job? The job is not to define and prescribe. The job is to create a safe place where you can be the most brutal person in questioning the choices that somebody's going to make. And that seems to me the right way of commissioning. And um, when you actually work with filmmakers, how much influence do you have with them? It varies hugely. Um, I mean, to Mike Lee, hmm? he comes in and he says, um, <laughs> I'm not telling you the idea. I don't know, um, I don't know who's going to be in it. Um, and um, it's probably going to cost quite a lot of money, and, and or not, depending on what the year is and what he's got in his head. Are you up for it? And you go, I go, yes. I actually think he's, bec you know, he's becoming, I mean, he's always been a, a ma magnificent director, but I think his work gets better mm. and better. And Mr. Turner, which yeah. um, we'll see a tiny bit of later, is, is an absolutely fantastic piece yeah. of work. But then there are others who require huge engagement all the way through. I want to just, you, you actually mentioned Andrea Arnold, uh, and uh, that is a case in point of, you know, I, I think that the, the thing is that we can all kind of name the women directors out there because we don't actually have to remember many names. I mean, yes. this is part of the problem with film. And I wonder how you, what you think about that and why you think that is. Well, what I think about it is that it's wrong and horrible. Um, um, and that we have, of course, at Film4 done whatever we can to address a balance of, a massive gender imbalance mm. in film. But you're absolutely right to say that it is exceptional women who break through, and where are the good enough who mm. can keep on trying to mm. do it? I mean, there are many, many, many reasons for this, and not least you look at the world around you, you look at the world of leadership and ask the question, is it possible to be ourselves as women and lead in a way that is other, that is different? You mean um, on a film set? On a film set as well as a company as well yeah. as in anything, as well as a board, wherever it is, I think the idea of a different t type of leadership, a different sort of great 
a different sort of a critical assessment is extremely important part of our conversation, which we don't have often enough. Um, a film set is, is like leading an army, and there are very few women on a lot of film sets. So to be a woman on a film set and to recognise yourself nowhere on that set and to be mm. yourself and work as a woman mm -hmm. is complicated. I mean, this year it's very interesting. We've got um, a woman directing a, a very high-budget thriller, um, Susanna White, directing a John le Carre film. Lona Scherfick, <coughs> who's made um, The Riot Club with Laura Wade, which is an adaptation mm. of Posh. Um, Clio Barnard's just made The Selfish Giant. Andrea Arnold's about, about to make her next film. Debbie Tucker Green has just made mm. her first feature film. There are a number of women, but you're right, you probably know those names. Um, so what we do as an active thing is, you know, invite Lucy Kirkwood, brilliant screenwriter mm. and playwright, to make her first short film, or Natasha but you actively, so, you, know, you, actively, you actively... You're not in a position now, but when, have you left behind a culture which is actually actively looking at different ways to have that film set, it's interesting you talk about that, that whole film set culture being very macho and how it's like leading an army. And I wonder if there's a resistance on a film set to having, a, interesting, having a, a woman director and actually take somebody with a lot of self-confidence, a lot of guts to be able to do it. And it must be incredibly tough. I think it you know, we're be. not all Jane Campion, we can't all do it our way. No, but we need the Jane Campions and the next generation to be clearly visible so that the next generation coming through realise that it is possible, mm -hmm. that they have those fantastic, you know, mm -hmm. mentors, if you like, or mm -hmm. um, examples of women who've done it. But I don't think one can sit here and say, I mean, it's just not good enough, and it's not good enough across the board. Yeah. Um, but we need it to be across all those areas of production. It's not just directors. We need those film sets populated differently as well. I mean, there have been reports recently that the BFI did on, on women mm. directors um, that women going in to be educated. So this is much later on, you know, that mm. this is not about early education. This is often graduate or postgraduate education. Women going in to film school are pretty equal to the men going in, but they're not going into the industry in the same balance. And that's terrifying, mm -hmm. isn't it? That people are giving up before they've given it a shot. So how do we change that? So we have to look at the much wider picture mm -hmm. and look at the world we live in. Uh, looking at the, the range of films on, on that clip tape, it, 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 either by accent or design, it seems that what you've done is you've found an incredibly vibrant way to reflect the United Kingdom back to itself. I mean, do you think that well, what you really set out to do was to tell us something about ourselves in the films? You know, particularly in your, in your nurturing of people like, well, obviously like Steve McQueen, but also like Shane Meadows. Yes. Um, well, it's lovely to look at it summed up, but I would certainly say that the question one that I have asked and we have asked is why, why now? Why would you make this now? What, why is this resonant for an audience mm -hmm, now? Mm -hmm. um, that actually we're not looking for a reflection of the status quo, I think, in any of the films we're making. So even if we're taking a period adaptation like Wuthering Heights, yeah. we're asking ourselves the question, what does this mean either to you, the filmmaker, and therefore to the audience that you're showing it to? And what is, what is that sort of gut instinct about what urgency that film will have to an audience now? So there probably is, you sum it up beautifully by saying, reflect the nation back to itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's all about looking for the resonance that is 100% contemporary and mm -hmm. makes that a, a decision that has to be made in 2014 mm -hmm. rather than it could wait for another mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, hands up, anything to ask Tessa just now? I just wanted to take a break. Yes, right, bang in the middle. If you scoot in with that one. And any more hands over this side so we can get any more? We'll take that question. Now, anyone up this side? Right, let's just take your question now just for... Uh, hi, Tessa. Um, one of the biggest things in Film 4's release thing last year for me was Ben Wheatley's A Field in England. So I should say that again? Sir? Oh, sorry. One of the bigger moments in Film 4 in the last year for me was Ben Wheatley's A Field in England, which obviously had a very uh, brave kind of release schedule where it was on DVD, television, cinemas all at the same time. Yes. Uh, do you judge that experiment to be a success? And is it, do you think it's a method that the film industry in Britain should be pursuing more in the future? Um, I mean, a very simple answer was it was a success. I mean, it, it, it delivered a, an, a hugely experimental film and a filmmaker that we know has a massive mm. cult following that we would love to be broader to television um, in a way that probably wouldn't have happened had we not done that brilliant, engaged strategy, but also to work on a digital strategy that, that allowed audiences to find it in a number of different ways at, at the same time. 
Um, we will do it again, or I won't do it again, but I'm sure the team will do it again. Um, and we did it for a number of reasons. We did it because we realised that as a television channel, we're waiting for a long time for films to come back to us. So at what price can we make pr films and actually own them ourselves and therefore play with them differently, play with those windows differently? And that was a very, very good experiment. Um, but also to give freedom to filmmakers at a much lower budget. How can you make differently? And Ben, as you know on that film, did a how-to of low-budget filmmaking, and that was incredibly valuable. So that's a very quick answer, but yes. It's um, also, I mean, is it a question of you having a sort of exceptionally good taste in film? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's just stop there now. Um, no, but I mean, it's just, you just seem to, I mean, it, you know, and I mean, I know David Abrams is here, but... Um, and you probably got extra money by cleaning his house or something, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it seems to me that uh, you, you're, you have just defined, at a time, uh, there's been lots of times during your period at Film 4 where you have kind of reflected the best of Channel 4 in a way. You know, the, the, you know that, that relationship has only made Channel 4 seem, you know, sassy and brilliant but because what a Film privilege. 4. I love Channel 4. Mm. And, and, you know, when... Danny Boyle came back to Channel 4 with his Oscars with Simon and Christian, his writer and producer. And when Steve McQueen brought his Oscar into the channel, the whole of the channel stood on the balconies and clapped them. And that's two experiences that I will never forget, mm -hmm. that a whole place can be so proud mm -hmm. of something that when I joined seemed not, not to be doing the thing that it should do. I mean, we're a tiny mm -hmm. proportion of that channel. 15 million quid a year is a tiny proportion of what it spends. But do you feel, as a commercial broadcaster, do you feel pressure? It's a public service broadcaster. Mm. But I mean, you, you have to, there, there is, I mean, if you, if you had your, your 50 million pot, it's, it's both public service and commercial, isn't it? And but it's commercial for a purpose. It's commercial because it has to earn its own money. Mm. It's commercial because every penny it earns goes back into what it makes. And of course, what it's doing, and I'm grateful for it, is balancing its investment and programming yeah. to make sure that in areas of programming where it is building revenue yeah. and delivering yeah. revenue, I can go and they make a field in England if it hadn't worked. Yes. So thank goodness for that. Yes, because well, I mean, the, obvi the obvious question is that you take something like 12 Years a Slave, which will bring revenue, presumably, to film for, for perpetuity as long as the film sells and DVD and everything else. And that allows the nurturing of new talent. But that actually isn't the way it works. I mean, I wish it were that simple, but don't forget we're a small corner of a big film. Well, yes. So we're a small corner of a big film, and Slumdog is a very good example of this, a film that we developed. We developed before a producer was involved. We co-financed with our producer without a studio being involved. The studio bought the film when it was financed. Mm. Um, the money that was made went to the biggest investor in the film. Yeah. After all, the different cuts came off distribution, exhibition, and everything mm. else. Channel 4 made a very good return on, a, on its investment, at about 300%. Mm -hmm. But it's, and actually that goes back into the channel. Mm. It doesn't come back into Film 4 for a very good reason. And that is, I felt that what we needed was a sustainable pot that was available to the industry at the same level every year, yeah. year in, year out. Because what the industry found so difficult was that there was a boom year and then it was mm -hmm. great for a few years and there was 35 million and hooray, mm -hmm. they meant it, and then there was nothing. And actually what you need is to know... altruistic. But no, it's not altruistic. It's why are you there? It's for the industry. Yeah. Now, take that question, please. Um, hi. I was wondering, um, obviously, you've um, been involved with so many projects over the years, so many film projects. What is it that draws you initially to something and says, well, I'm more interested in this one and you know, I'm going to go for this and focus on this one rather than the other. Is, is it the people involved? Is it the reputation? Is it this access to story? What, I mean, what is it that, that makes the films, that, you know, draws you to the films that you make? Yeah, no, it's always the people. It's mm -hmm. always the people. I mean, and it's not just me, as I say. It's a whole load of people reading, meeting, talking. So there's a rigour behind those people and behind meeting those people and talking to those people. There's the scripts they've written, the films they've made before, the ideas they've got, the way they express those ideas, the references to other films, other ideas, other mm. art that they bring to those films. But in the end, it's the way you believe people. You but believe that people can do what they say they're going to do. But has somebody ever brought you the idea for a film practically in the back of an envelope? Well, I mean, obviously, Mike Lee doesn't even bother with the envelope, but I mean, <laughs> but if it's brought you the film in the back of an envelope, and then you said, we need to do this. I know I will find a way to do this. I'll put this person with this person, this idea with that idea, and this script, yeah. and we'll make it. Just with, just with a single thought. Yes. What film um, can you remember? Well, the first film I commissioned at Film 4 was Dead Man's Shoes. And I absolutely loved Shane Meadows before I met Shane Meadows, although I'd met him briefly at Toronto at the film festival. Mm -hmm 
a couple of years before, maybe more than that, five years before, on 24-7. And um, he came into the office, and he's this gorgeous, warm, funny, complicated, clever man. And he pitched a, a superhero comedy, which I said yes to like that. I thought, that's lucky. I've got nothing in the closet. I've got nothing to make. Hooray, I've got a Shane Meadows film, and we can go straight into a low-budget production. And that film very quickly in the workshop became Dead Man's Shoes, which, mm. of course, is a revenge thriller tragedy. Um, not in any way a comedy, but, um, um, but that's fine. But, I believed Shane, and I'd seen uh, his work. So in a, it's similar to the answer to that question. Um, it wasn't a huge risk. It yeah. was a risk of, a very, of under a million, quite a lot under a million, mm. um, that we were going to co-finance with the regional film fund. Mm. And, um, and we went for it. And it turned out to be a very good decision. Bang, uh, question right in the middle. And while the, uh, while the microphone's going in, I was going to say, uh, uh, there's so much to ask in so little time, but uh, going on to the national, how many other relationships will you take with you? Can you imagine a film director? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, theatre directors become film directors, then maybe you'll get film directors suddenly to become theatre directors. Definitely, we've got to do that. Oh, good. <laughs> any ideas, any names? No, well, no, I'm, look, it, the whole point is, I think, that these things merge closely together. And when I worked in telly, and the idea that television couldn't possibly deliver to film or vice versa. Of course, that's disappeared mm -hmm. completely. That Shane Meadows makes This Is England for television, having launched it as a wonderful mm -hmm. feature film. That Danny Boyle makes television. That, you mm -hmm. know, we know from our conversations about how brilliant HBO is that film directors now see their mm -hmm. lives as long running serials. Well, brilliant. Well, theatre's the same. Theatre's storytelling. Theatre's using brilliant relationships with audiences. And you began it's just theatre. And I did. But I don't see why great talent can't play the game right. lots of places. Take the question, please. Well, that's Thank actually you. weirdly exactly what I was going to yeah. ask. Oh, sorry. I suppose it's um, maybe thinking about it the other way around, though. It does seem like it's more difficult, perhaps, for TV directors to break into film directing. So I was thinking about Mark Mundon, for example, and Utopia had such a cinematic vision for that. Yes. But it's never managed to sort of... Well, he has. He has made a film. Oh, he has made, made a film. Yeah. Okay. okay. He made so a I film called Miranda. Um, I agree with you. I think it's very difficult. I mean, Yann Demange, for example, is a, is a television director who's just made his first feature film. And it's fantastic. It's called 71. So, it, it, of course, you know, you, you look for talent everywhere. Um, but there aren't that many opportunities. And I think that's always the wrestling we're well, having. We're going, so to, see, we're going to see a wee bit of that. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. It's not a sort of, you don't think there's a kind of inherent different sensibility or anything like that. It's yeah. just enough matter of opportunity, you, you think. Well, I think they've got, again, you know, in the end, there's purity in all these things, and the purest version of all of them can't really collide with the other. Mm. But in the middle, they're so connected, and we should be looking for that connection in the way that Kevin MacDonald made Touching the Void for Telly. It yeah. became a feature film. He made Last King of Scotland. Aren't we lucky that talent can move around? And we're going to talk about some of the talent that's in the, the clips tape coming up in a moment. But, I mean... The creativity and the culture and the, the way that you have brought together this team of people at Channel 4, that atmosphere you've created, could you create it at the BBC? Do you mean, is it creatable at the BBC? I mean both. <laughs> um, um, well, the answer to both has to be yes. I mean, look, I want to live till I'm 97 and a half at least, and I want to work till I'm 87 and a half at least. So, yes, I would want to go in there and make a place I believe in creative. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do it? Of course it is, and there must be brilliant pockets of the BBC now. But the answer to that is, you know, you have to believe that it's possible, mm -hmm. don't you? That I mean, great talent, if great... anyone's here from the National Theatre, you know, Tessa Ross is going to the National Theatre. <laughs> but for how long? Because, you know, if the BBC comes a calling, you would never turn it down, would you? Well, it depends what it came calling for. <laughs> Give it a reinvent drama on the BBC. Yeah, but that's, but, you know, that's, that's, a, that's fiction, a long time ahead. Head of fiction. Yeah, that's a lovely question. But it's because <laughs> I want to work a long time, one day. But I've got a really good job to do at the moment. You so, have, yeah. indeed. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to do it brilliantly. But let's see uh, what you are actually leaving behind. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about practically every single film there. I mean, <laughs> extraordinary. But let's... Um, Let's talk about Carol, because that's got a very particular story of how this could never have been made, say, 40 years ago, because of the problems well, with the book. The book had been... Well, the book was banned when it was first published, but it was a project that had been in development... I mean, it's been in development all of my time at Film 4 and, be, and before. So it was a script that had been put into turnaround before I started the job. But you knew you wanted to make it back as soon as you took over? I knew that the script was brilliant, and actually it was represented to me by a producer. Um, and it is an absolutely brilliant script by a, a, a writer called Phyllis Nage, who's known better as a playwright. 
and, and she had made a film for HBO called Mrs. Harris, which had won an Emmy, I think, uh, um, certainly, or a Golden Globe, but it was a fantastic single film for HBO, starring Annette Benning and Ben Kingsley. Um, and I read this script, which I thought was just a pitch-perfect per adaptation. But it's taken us, I mean, the whole of my time there to get it made for a number of reasons, complicated by how we would make it and, um, and actually our inability to, I think, probably concentrate on the scale of it and how it would be yeah. cast. But the minute that Kate Blanchett said she wanted to do it, um, and that Todd Haynes, who seemed the most, who probably always was, but now looks like the most brilliant, perfect director for it, I mean, bullseye director, um, we were able to raise the finance mm -hmm. for it. And it's a, I mean, it's a story of, of a lesbian affair at a mm -hmm. time when it was absolutely unthinkable mm -hmm. that a mother could be gay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's incredibly romantic and beautifully made. And it's still not quite finished. Um, and I'm very, very proud of it. But it's not a film I would... I wouldn't say my job is to make a film with Todd Haynes. Yeah. Todd Haynes is a celebrated American mm -hmm. filmmaker. But it was my job to get that script made. Um, by a writer who resided in this country with a producer who was a British producer. And so that's what we put our energy and, into. And then Suffragette. And Suffragette um, is um, a wonderful second film, in, still in the cutting room as well, from Sarah Gavron. Sarah Gavron, who'd made a piece of television called This Little Life, straight after film school, which was fantastic. And then her first feature film, Brit Lane With Us. Um, and it's taken her this time to make her second film. It, it, it's interesting because again, Brick Lane was not necessarily, well it wasn't a commercial success obviously, but that no. allowed you to develop as Sarah Gavron and you stuck with her. Yes, I completely understand Sarah's need to feel every beat of her film. Um, and I think she's a very fine filmmaker. And what's extraordinary about this is the, the, the journey that she's made as a filmmaker. I mean, you can see from those clips, this is a pretty huge set. There are tons of mm. people on it. It's got massive energy. Um, and there's a muscle running through this film that I would say she's discovered, even though she hasn't made a film. I mean, she's made a small documentary film and, and been behind a camera, but she's not made a feature film. And um, I'm blown away, actually, by how she's grown up as a filmmaker as well. She's a fantastically intelligent woman. Abby Morgan remained her partner again yeah. as a writer. Um, it was produced by a woman, Faye Ward. Um, it's a story in a moment in history which I think people don't remember or don't know. Um, and it's incredibly important. And she's made a mainstream, urgent film about mm. that moment in history. So um, as you leave Channel 4, um, sorry, BBC, sorry, Film 4, <laughs> Channel 4, <laughs> Film 4, how much are you, what, what's in the war chest, what's in the chest? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, there's, because our, a lot of our energy goes into development, there's a good raft of great projects and relationships with writers and filmmakers that I hope my very clever successor, who's here, I can see him, um, will be excited by. But the, the, but the opportunity is there for him to be excited by some mm. and not by others. But, but uh, of the ones they're sponsoring, who is going to be the next Shane Meadows of the first-time filmmakers? Who's going to be the next Shane Meadows, do you think, the ones you've been sponsoring? That's, there's nobody like Shane Meadows. Um, but there is a raft of incredibly exciting filmmakers coming through. Mm. How um, many projects are on the slate? I would say there are about 80 live projects on 80. the slate. But that's normal. I mean, you know, if you think how hard it is to get a film mm. made and how long it takes to deliver a script and a second, third, fourth draft, I don't think this is unusual, particularly if you're trying to actually have a say in what gets made, which yeah. we are, because we're trying to do the thing of pushing the ideas forward. And now you're going to the National Theatre. So what job is kind of big enough for Tessa Ross at the National <laughs> Theatre? Are you just going to work two days a week? Uh, that's very nice. Well, it, what's the, the, for me, the, the pleasure of going there is an institution, a public institution, again, that I've always loved. Mm. Um, this is before you go to the BBC, of course, but yes. <laughs> it's so nice that you've written my career ahead, so I don't have to worry. So um, yes, at, at the National. But it's, you know, it's, it's talent I know, talent I don't know. A building, a place which I can, you know, I can get to grips with 800 people in a building. I can understand the function of all of it, not just a little bit of it. Um, I love the fact that the theatre is immediate, that the fact that it's magic made in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that there will be writers I don't know and directors mm -hmm. I don't know and so much to learn. The mm -hmm. idea that there's a challenge in making a place feel different and taking it forward for the next generation. I'm excited that it, there's an opportunity there to bring young people into that Yes, place. I was going to say, is that, do you think that was that you know, part of the thing they came to when they came to and wanted you to do it? Was that the part? What was that the part that you wanted the most was working with 
new talent, bringing new talent on, which of course then we can be fed through, as you say, to film and backwards again. In truth, I'm inter I, there was no one bit of it. The idea was that it was all of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to learn that I've got muscles I didn't know I had, if that's possible. I don't know if mm -hmm. that can be. Um, but it's the idea that one's, one's looking at an, a, a whole over, oversight of mm -hmm. money, talent, building, audience, arts council, politics. I mean, it's the idea that it's all built around a big idea, which is how do you make the best theatre in the world in a building on the South Bank and make it accessible to as many people in the country as possible. And that seems to me a brilliant ideal. Well, what a wonderful time to stop this interview. Thank you very much indeed to Tessa Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you.